All right, let's get going. It looks like the number of participants has tapered off. So I think this is a great time for us to really get going here. And so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Of course, thank you all of you attendees that are here for high energy materials. And thank you so much for our panelists. And I'm gonna ask our panelists to in turn do a brief introduction of themselves, talk about their role a little bit and what they do and their, you know, what their role is relative to this, to this topic. And then we will jump right into our conversation, a little bit of multi in, um, uh, interview sort of between uh, the four of us and our uh, experts uh, answering a bunch of questions. And then as always, everyone who's on uh, the webinar in case um, that you're new to us or it's just been a while, which it has, please use the chat for fun conversation. But any questions you have, please post at any time in the Q&A so that we see it. The chat tends to scroll and stuff disappears and we'd hate to miss out on a question that you'd really love for the guys to answer. So ask away at any time at about uh, 20 of the next hour is when we'll probably transition over and, um, and take care of all of that. Well, great. All right. So in uh, no particular order, I guess, I, uh, I'm going to go clockwise on my screen. So Bart, <laughs> if you don't mind introducing yourself, please first. OK, no problem. Oh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Bart Ervo, and I'm uh, working as a uh, reactive chemicals expert at the uh, Dow Chemical Company. Uh, and I'm located in Toulouse in the Netherlands, so a country in, uh, in Europe. So I'm, I think, the furthest away uh, from, for all participants to this, uh, to this uh, meeting today. Um, and as a reactive chemicals uh, person, uh, yeah, I help uh, with uh, process owners or, or different businesses in our company. So both from, from small scale R&D to, to large scale manufacturing. And we, we help them to identify uh, reactive chemicals, um, risks, risks and, and hazards. And we do this um, by using yeah, modeling software or by doing literature search or by doing uh, yeah, lab, lab scale uh, testing. To quantify, uh, yeah, the extent of the of the hazards uh, that that people have in the in their lab, and also the the magnitude of, of energy that uh, that can be released. Um, before joining uh, the reactive chemicals uh, group, I, I worked also uh, as an inorganic uh, analytical specialist also at Dow, and uh, by education I'm an uh, organic polymer chemist, uh, and in my free time. Uh, I, I like to work in and around my house, and also I like to, to cycle uh, a lot. Yeah. I thought I was concerned you were going to say you like to blow things up <laughs> in your free time. <laughs> we, we try to prevent it, uh, or at least in a controlled way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, at least at least I share with you a fondness for for bicy bicycling. Right? Biking. You meant bicycling? Yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Well, I have a buddy who who likes to ride his bike a lot, but that's a, a motorcycle. <laughs> I have to do it myself. Uh, yeah, me too. Human power. That's that's for yeah. me. All right, good. In in my direction, Ashok, you are up next, sir, oh, please. Great, thanks. Uh, Ashok Dastener, um, and I'm from Fauskin Associates, which um, is primarily a nuclear and chemical process safety company. Uh, we are part of uh, Westinghouse Electric Company, so that's our parent. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, nuclear safety work that we do, but we also do a lot of chemical process safety. So looking at runaway reactions, thermal stability work. Um, my area of, uh, of concentration is gas vapor explosions as well as dust cloud explosions and dust fires. So we, we typically do lab work as well as consulting work. And part of it is also um, accident investigation also, you know, uh, uh, consulting to avoid accidents. So we do get a lot of chance to see people with high energetic materials that will need some help in determining the safety envelope in which they're, they're going to operate. Or mm -hmm. potentially, uh, you know, when they're conducting their internal HAZOPs, um, what could happen if, you know, contamination occurs? Uh, what could happen if uh, unit operations or mechanical failures occur or electrical failures occur 
what could happen to their chemical if it happens to lose happens to lose cooling, or if they happen to have a fire uh, at their facility, how could their material happen to run away and then explode? So that's our primary of uh, area of concentration and expertise. Neat, neat. And, and I didn't realize how much you guys do. The first time I think I heard of FOSC, it was way, way back when combustible dust were becoming a big thing. And it was, well, if I need to get this tested, if I need to, is it K value, as I recall? Uh, right? KST, right. KST, yeah. We've been doing yeah. that since, we've been doing that since 82. And I remember, yeah, yeah, everyone on like the safety list, there was FOSC, 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 FOSC. <laughs> All right. Well, great. This is wonderful. And Min, please, will you, will you introduce yourself, sir? Everyone, uh, I'm uh, Disney Min Sheng. Uh, I'm working for uh, Cultivar Agroscience uh, right now. Uh, back in the day, I was uh, uh, working, start joining my career from the Dow React Chemical Group and then stay in Dow for about six years uh, and locally in uh, Midland, Michigan. Uh, the headquarter of uh, of Dow, Dow Chemicals, and uh, I learned a lot uh, on the red chemical and also a lot on this uh, uh, high energy materials. Uh, I think uh, high energy material it's a uh, it's a special chemicals uh, need special attention, and then we just need to be uh, watching on it, uh, be careful, and do the needed the tester to make sure we don't have the the the, 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 the uh, ex, uh, supplies later. Uh, after the Dow and the Dubon merchants uh, and spilling back in uh, 2017, I'm the only RC SME joined the, the agro company. And then I start to build the uh, established the real chemical uh, group for the new company. So right now, uh, the groups uh, expand from just myself to about 10 people. And we have two, test, two testing labs. And uh, the whole teams cover uh, the global RC hazards. Uh, since we are agro science company, we have a lot of synthesis. And then due to the, uh, the favorite of the free energies, uh, the favorite of the, uh, uh, the, the, the enthalpies, so high energy material actually used a lot in the organic synthesis. It's just the nature of the chemistry is, is running faster. So we tend to use that a lot. So that made a lot of challenge for us. And uh, also, as I said, it's a fun, it's fun chemical, chem, chemicals and we just need to pay attention to it. Definitely. Yeah, it's interesting for me. Of course, I know uh, a couple of the people at Corteva AgriScience and it's like, hey, it's AgriScience. We're growing things. It must be easy and safe and everything else. And it can be, but boy, there's a lot of of really uh, uh, incredible, uh, obviously, chemistry <clears throat> and process engineering that goes into this. Well, let's start to talk about this. I think that's a good segue. Maybe we can do a little bit of sort of classifying and sorting between the three of you and feel free to go in whatever direction works. There's gonna be overlap in the answers, et cetera. But the first is really, you know, what do we consider a high energy material? What, what, what do you guys use as good working definitions and are there good examples for uh, categories? And um, I'll go in reverse order just to change things up. So Min, if you don't mind starting us off, please. Yep, uh, for us, uh, typically, for high energy material, we typically look at the structure of the chemical and then go with the function group. So it's a, a couple of uh, high energy function group actually they can catch eye and then put a red flag on those projects. Uh, we can look at it further. And then once we have that, we do more testing, identify, uh, identify when and how much energy of those material and then go from that. So I think uh, we, that's, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's good. And uh, Ashok, what do you want to add to that or, or validate or whatever you would like to do, sir? No, no, I, I think that, that's an excellent, excellent uh, starting point. I think that we also look at situations where uh, contamination can occur. Mm -hmm. So you might have a, an oxidizer that you're processing in your, in, in your environment uh, for either as, a, as a, um, a reactant or as a product. And if you do get some sort of contamination of organic material, let's say when you're dealing with, let's say a peroxide or when you're dealing with a, with a nitrate, you know, how can that then run away on you? So it's like the expected material that you're processing and you can understand um, the hazards or the dangers of it, but also the, the concept of, well, what are the unknowns that can happen um, in an upset scenario? Or let's say if, um, let's say if uh, some contamination were to occur in the process. Uh, what kind of upsets could also occur at that point. So I think those are kind of things where we start off with, 
yes, there's things that we inherently know that are high energy that we deal with, like the, you know, perchlorates, uh, perchlor ammonium perchlorate and, and the uh, diethyl ether and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then also there's the things where, well, we didn't expect this to be as dangerous as we thought it was going to be. And therefore the safety engineered safety, administrative safety isn't there um, once uh, an upset scenario, loss of cooling uh, occurs, or if there is something where there's contamination involved. Cool. That's great. And can you help uh, at least me out, maybe others in our audience, Ashok, when you say, uh, when you use the term upset, it, it sounds like it's a term of art. It sounds like it has more uh, definition to it than just the common dictionary definition. Can you just give us a, a sure. couple of so, sentences on that, please? So, so there could be things like pipe failures that might occur, or like the loss of cooling that might occur. Um, um, you know, also, a lot of these reactions, especially the batch reactions, require a lot of stirring mm -hmm. in order for you know proper heat transfer and and avoiding thermal runaway. So, what happens if let's say you lose loss of stirring or or if you lose stirring uh, capabilities? What's going to happen to your situation? So, an upset is a situation that's not as expected. Okay, so it's really pretty much the same as the dictionary definition. But that your examples helped me a lot. Thanks so much. All right, and Barb. What, what else would you like to add to this, please? Um, maybe just first, I would like to add a small comment on the upset uh, hmm. answer uh, of a shock. Uh, I think we should also realize that even small changes uh, in temperature, for instance, can already be an upset situation and can hmm. turn into a runaway situation. So that should be realized. Hmm. One or two degrees difference can, can turn it from a controlled situation into a, an uncontrolled situation. So that's often not recognized when people, oh, I, I turn up the temperature uh, two degrees C to speed up my reaction, but it can have huge uh, consequences. No. Right. Maybe to, uh, to come back then on the definition mm. of, of high energy, I think Min and Ashok already mentioned a few good things. So in fact, it's indeed a material which contains a lot of energy, but I think it's also important that it's released in a rapid way or in a fast manner. So uh, you can have, for instance, a lot of materials that contain a lot of energy, for instance, oxidation reactions, typically, or iron, for instance, iron oxidation. It's a very energetic reaction, but it typically is, is occurring on a, on a very long time frame. So, so the energy re is released on a very long time frame. So that, that's also important that it's released in a rapid uh, or in a fast way. Um, yeah, why do we care about this uh, this mm. high high energy? So I think it's because yeah, it can harm people. So if it's releasing in a very fast way, it can harm equipment, can harm our equipment, can harm the environment. It also can yeah, and that's the worst case I think can harm people uh, or injure people or even kill people, and that's uh, where the rapid uh, comes into play. I think. Yeah, it seems to me that rate matters a lot in life, right? How fast are you going, yep. you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, uh, and uh, any of you guys, but maybe Ashok, correct me if I'm wrong. If, as I remember, one of the five factors for combustible dust is rate of pressure rise. Is that right? Right. That's one of the, one of the components that you measure to assess the intensity mm. of whether it's a dust that's exploding or whether it's a gas vapor mixture okay. um, that's also exploding. It's, it's how fast is it going mm. to explode? that mm -hmm. could change the intensity of the process. So sure. for example, hydrogen reacts a lot faster than methane. Mm. And you're going to get a different combustion dynamic mm. with hydrogen than you would with methane. So therefore your protection schemes have to be different as well. Cool. Well, let's talk some more about these different sort of situations and applications. So maybe things like phases and um, pre uh, uh, pressure, uh, volume, temperature, PVT changes, mixtures, et cetera. What, what sort of ones should we consider, guys? And be it, you know, as, as you guys are saying, you know, there's dust, there's gas, vapor, waste, uh, nitrogen aspects, organics, as Min mentioned, all of these sorts of things. So, so what do you think um, are the ones we should really be uh, looking at there from what each of you are seeing? And I'll mix it up. And this time I'll start actually where we just were with Ashok. Um, I think for a lot of what we look at is um, the gas vapor phase uh, mm. for, for mm. reactivity. The, you have um, a molecule reacting with a molecule in a confined space, 
and that could be you know an oxidizer and, and and a fuel and because you have molecular level reactions in in a volume in a suspended air you get a lot faster reaction um, when you look to the solid phase if you look at start looking at dust and oxygen reactions the the material on the uh, that's the particle of material that you're looking at let's say whether it's whether it's um, toner dust, whether it's a pigment, whether it's a pharmaceutical or, or an agricultural material like cornstarch, um, the fuel actually has to vaporize, become a gas, then mix with the oxygen and ignite to then create that combustion wave to propagate downward. So that adds an additional complexity in the step. But then, you know, depending on the particle size, you get faster reactions. So mm -hmm. I think it really comes back down to how available is that molecule to react with an oxidizer? And then it's totally different if that molecule has to react with itself mm -hmm. and you have a decomp reaction going on, okay. uh, a decomp in the vapor space versus a decomp in the liquid phase. Cool, great, thanks. Uh, Bart, do you wanna go next? And what, what else would you like to add to this, please? Yeah, of course, indeed, uh, yeah, vapor phase reactions are, are very fast reactions, but we should also consider that, that liquid phases have a very high energy density. So if we contaminate suddenly uh, a liquid phase with a certain chemical, which is not compatible, um, then it can release a lot of energy in a, yeah, in a very small uh, area. So that's something that should be considered uh, as well. Um, and indeed, people often forget um, yeah, that you should not mix up uh, incompatible material, and especially in the case of high energy materials, uh, if it's just uh, water with uh, yeah, uh, acid, with acid, it's just uh, some heat of dilution. Doesn't matter too much, but if it's an acid with uh, with an organic, so nitric mm -hmm. acid, for instance, strong oxidizer and acid with an uh, with an organic like acetone or whatever, uh, any other uh, organic compound, then it can uh, release a lot of gas energy uh, in a very short time frame. So there are uh, the hazards also. Yeah. Yeah, good, great. And Min, what about from your perspective, please? Yep. Uh, yeah, both of, both, both of us mentioned a uh, really good point. I think uh, I totally agree that uh, high energy material release a lot, a, lot, a lot of energy, which is why the name is high energy materials. For us in our group, we can tend to use a cut. We go with the DSC if the energy is greater than 800 joule per gram. We classify as high energies. So high energy, uh, there's two, and for us, we calculate as uh, stable or unstable. So stable means like you need some conditions such as high temperature or impact or friction to to ignite the ignite the material. So those material is 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 bad bad better, but the worst one is unstable, which is uh, uh, like onset temperature above 100 C, and then they're not they're not degraded at ambient temperature, but they're just still there until you touch it, you 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 just move uh, move a little bit, and then they get ignition ignitions. So and those and, and it, that material is, is, the, is the worst to handle. So we try to know that before uh, we actually do the manufacture in the plan. Uh, sometimes uh, it happens. <laughs> we just cannot understand everything. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Thanks so much. All right. Yeah, maybe if I can right. add uh, one more thing, uh, mm -hmm. one other risk related to, to phase transitions and different phases is uh, maybe also evaporation, uh, because if you have a solution of a high energy ma material in a certain volatile solvent and you leave it, for instance, on your lab bench, you leave it overnight evaporating, then you suddenly end up with a highly concentrated, uh, in that case, it might be a solid phase or a liquid phase, but then suddenly you end up with a, with a, with a high concentrated uh, phase and a lot of high energy materials are also indeed uh, shock and friction sensitive. And then suddenly the, the least amount of energy that you apply can already uh, yeah, initiate the decomposition or detonation or deflagration uh, reactions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's funny that you mentioned de detonation versus deflagration. The first time I learned that difference was from a um, aerospace engineering uh, researcher uh, after we we had a deflagration, <clears throat> and he wanted to make it clear it was not a detonation. 
And so speed, speed of sound, right? Mm -hmm. So deflagrations yep. under the speed Indeed. of sound, detonations above the speed of sound, right? No. Yep. Yeah, fascinating. All right, great. All right, the next one, I wanna combine a couple of different things uh, last on this sort of sorting and classifying area, and then we'll get into maybe more on assessments, which I think is a great topic too. So does functional group recognition really help to sort these out uh, for you guys? And maybe along with that, it relates, I think, a little bit. Are there specific classes that you commonly encounter to help kind of people sort these into buckets? And again, leaving off where, where we just were, Bart, if you don't mind going first, please, sir. Yeah, I think that there are indeed a lot of functional groups that are typical for, for high energy materials, like a lot of nitrogen components, like acid, uh, like diiso di compounds, nitro compounds, uh, yeah, um, azides um, or typical high energy materials, also triple bonds like acetylides uh, are typical examples. Another class might be, for instance, Peroxides and, and peroxide formers. Uh, that's also a typical uh, um, high energy material or could form high energy material. Um, also, strong oxidizers, uh, strong reducers uh, might also be uh, uh, high energy materials. So, within DAO, for instance, we, we have some some lists that, that we collected from literature and, and other resources that we, that we combined, and, and we have, uh, yeah, we have group them in different classes, uh, all those materials. So if we see such kind of material um, in a reaction that, that somebody wants to perform, that's always a, a trigger uh, for us to uh, to look for it. But of course, it's not a uh, limited list. So uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a good starting always... point anyway. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah great. Min, uh, would you please go next? Uh, the, yeah, as as Bob mentioned, it's a a, a list of uh, high energy groups we always keep in mind, and uh, I, my I actually force my my teams to remember dot tables uh, when they join in, and then that is, is the first uh, first thing you you will go with for this kind of material. You if you see those kind of functional group, yeah, you had a red flag. That means you have you, you we have bad thing just to, to just uh, uh, raise that word list. And uh, I think I see two references I can send her through the chat. Uh, there's a couple of examples of the uh, high energy function groups. Yeah, thank you so much for noticing that. I, I think uh, Bart and Ashok also saw that. <clears throat> Sorry about my throat, everyone. Megan uh, asked, would Bart be willing to share that list? It would be very helpful. Jessica seconded that. And Jack, in a very helpful way, said best to put it in the Q&A, just to be sure. And yes, that's right. true. But you can see that that we're trying to keep track of these things, everyone. So yeah, any of the resources that we mentioned, we will definitely try to post those in the chat, make them clickable for you if it's uh, an online uh, list, or at least at the very least, the name of the list or whatever. So, so guys, Bart, Ashok, and Min, please go for it. Don't worry about it. There we go. We're starting to see some yeah, of Min's that. Yeah, so. putting stuff in there. So yeah, exactly. Thanks, guys. Really <laughs> appreciate it. And Ashok. <laughs> Yeah, sure. No, 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 no worries. Um, and, you know, Bart and Min definitely made really, really great points. And I think the idea is that like these functional groups, you know, Bart, Bart is correct. We, but we don't know everything. Mm. We do have a very good understanding of a wide range of, of possible functional groups that are out there for peroxides or oxidizers or, or peroxide forming chemicals that are out there. So we can sort of piece together when we are working on a on a bench scale or, a, or or you know a formative stage in our in our synthesis process, that hey, uh, we know what we're working with or we know what we're going to try to form. Um, a lot of times, what we really have to be aware of are things where when we are forming something, and then like Bart mentioned, that when you start off at a certain temperature and you have a delta of maybe one or two degrees, you might start getting side reactions which you don't know about anymore. Mm. What are you forming at that point? Mm. And at that point, you might be forming, you know, functional groups that you weren't considering at lower temperatures or, or, or other chemistries. And then you have scenarios where, you know, you didn't expect those functional groups to exist in the first place. And now you have them and now you have to deal with them. Yeah, it from my you know, more of a layperson's perspective, it sounds like there's certain analogs. So some of it is analogic 
And, but then it's of a limited capacity where sometimes it, it isn't an analog anymore. And like you were saying, Ashok, you're getting into side reactions that maybe you weren't expecting or whatever. And now you have to look at it as something brand new and no longer um, uh, from an analogical standpoint. Well, so let's talk about assessments, guys. What types are available? Um, are there certain peak shape triggers? And you're going to have to help at least me with that <clears throat> for these. So maybe uh, calorimetric tests. And I know they come with abbreviation. So maybe you can help us with that. DSC, ARC, which is differential scanning calorimetry and accelerated rate calorimetry. And if someone quizzes me on those, I will fail miserably. So help us with the contextualization um, wherever applicable. And I think I will start uh, this time with Min, uh, if you don't mind, sir. Yep. Uh, typically, we do with the a a DSC because that's the easy one, quicker one, only need a couple of milligram sample to, to go. And then as, uh, that's a screen tools uh, to evaluate those material. And then if we get the energy grade them 800 joule per gram, so we had a red flag. And then also it depends on what scale is running. If the lab scale, maybe we don't we don't worry about too much. But if in the production, we may do more tests, such as the arc test you mentioned, which is the accelerating rate of calorimeter. And also we may also follow up by the uh, by the by the ham test, impact test, so, uh, friction test, and uh, the uh, what's other shock sensitivity test. So that we will make sure you are, can safely handle those material in the production scales. Cool. All right. And uh, Bar, how's about you going next? And then Ashok, you're going to have the wrap up. You're yeah, sort sure. of the, uh, I think, like the, the testing guy. So you'll cover anything that's left, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Bar, please. Yeah, indeed. Also, at Dow, we, we typically start with with a screening test if it's actually lab testing. Yeah, maybe a first thing that we do is literature searching uh, to see if, if we, we know something that is already described. If you don't find something, or indeed, if like Min is mentioning, if it's on larger scale that that we need some more certainty, then we do some initially some screening test to identify okay, well, what is the potential hazard. Typically, that's indeed done. Uh, with the DSC in the French or scanning calor calorimeter. The disadvantage of a, a DSC is of course that you only measure heat flows and, and no pressure. So therefore indeed, uh, we also perform typically then an uh, arc test uh, where we can also measure uh, both uh, exotherms and, and, and heat and uh, pressure uh, and pressure rate. Cool. Min was mentioning uh, not only the the total amount of energy is important, but also the we typically also look to the peak shape. So if we typically have a very sharp signal, even if it's lower in energy, that might be a trigger that, okay, there's something else going on than a, a simple reaction. It might be high energy or it might be, for instance, autocatalytic. So that, that triggers us to, to do some uh, additional testing. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right, and Ashok, what, no, what, I mean, what I, do you I, want to add now to this, or did I, they cover I, I everything both, for both you? I think both Bart and, and Min covered pretty much the, the major ones. Um, you can also do like adiabatic testing, hmm. where you're, you're, the, the arc isn't necessarily adiabatic, where you're looking at compensating for the heat losses to the environment, because sometimes that could also influence the temperature at which something takes off. If you're doing an arc test, it might take off at a higher temperature than expected, you're, you're tracking the, the temperature and pressure to some degree, but with an adiabatic reactor or calorimeter, you might see a little bit uh, different result. Also, um, reaction calorimetry. You know, if you really wanted to, uh, you know, using a microcalorimeter, look at heats generated during a, a chemical reaction process where, where things might uh, be generated as side reactions that you weren't really expecting to cool. get that. Yeah. Great. Great, thanks so much. So there's just, it, it feels like this is such a huge area and there's so many different directions to go and it's hard to capture it all. Um, but any, any additional help on sort of estimation methods that you guys uh, uh, would suggest that, that you use? Cheetah, I know is one that, that you guys mentioned to me earlier. You'll have to explain what that is. And easy ways, again, to really bucket these into groups or have we really, have we really covered that in, um, 
in depth. And the last thing, I'm sort of bucketing things together. Any more challenging assessments that you guys might do uh, as well. And so I think the next, uh, I think it's now to start with a shock, actually. No, I, I think cheat is a fantastic tool, uh, you know, um, for a reaction, um, you know, understanding. <clears throat> and a new addition to the Cheetah software has been to include, um, you know, additional Benson groups. So that when you're looking at your chemistries to find out, uh, you know, physical properties and, 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 and reactivities. Um, Cheetah has also recently included the chemical, NASA's chemical equilibrium program as well. So you can now generate constant volume combustion or constant pressure combustion and um, get, you know, pressure temperature data uh, that might occur from a unreal, unwanted reaction. And they are working on adapting other components from the, um, the NASA chemical equilibrium uh, program, including detonation. So that's a good tool. Uh, Dipper is a good tool to find out physical property data in case you need that as well. Those are two, two major programs that I think would be Great. Uh, important to start off with. Yeah. Cool. All right, Bart, I'll go to you next. And, and guys, anyone who wishes to feel free to put in the chat uh, any links to Cheetah or, or any of these other methods. Thanks. Bart, what would you like to also add to this? Yeah, in addition to, to Cheetah that we are also often using in, in our lab, uh, we, for instance, also have the CRW4 tool. That's a tool that uh, was developed in, in collaboration uh, with, with DAO and, and CCPS. Uh, so that's a, uh, a tool that you can download from the from the internet. Uh, you just have to register yourself and you, you can download it. It's in fact a compatibility chart uh, software tool. Uh, but you can also get information about your uh, about different chemicals. Uh, so properties of chemicals are also included. So that's also a resource that that we are using. And I, I saw also in the in the chat, Jeff Foisel is also uh, mentioning uh, the Bredericks Handbook, and that's indeed also a, a very great uh, resource for us. Uh, it contains a lot of historical incidents and and chemical information about uh, a wide variety of chemicals. Yeah. Yeah, and Marcus is indicating it could stand some updating and editing, but I know that it still has good value to it, but it would be nice. Everything eventually needs updating, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have more to add, Bart? Yeah, you were you were also asking about uh, yeah more challenging assessments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from every day we, we have such an assessment, so both in our lab, both from R&D and M&E. So if, for instance, R&D is, is investigating new, new chemistries, uh, yeah, th these are the challenging things that, that we have to investigate. So a recent example for, was, for instance, uh, uh, R&D wanted to, to investigate an, an, a mixture or a reaction between a, a nitrate salt and a citric acid or urea. And that's where we, we then came in, okay, nitrate is, is known to be an oxidizing component. Uh, could it be an issue with the citric acid or not, or with the urea? And, and in the end, we found out indeed with, with combination with citric acid as a, a very highly energetic and, and rapid reaction. With urea, we found out, although we expected also to be a, a rapid reaction with, with high energy, it was more moderate. So. Uh, we could approve in the end the reaction with the urea um, based on our testing that we have done. Yeah. Cool, great, thanks. And Min, what about from, from your perspective on estimations, bucketing groups or challenging uh, assessments for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, both Ashok and Brad um, covered the, the most tools. Uh, my favorite one is which is uh, uh, what Ashok, Ashok mentioned, the uh, cheetah. Uh, I, we do use the uh, chemical equivalent uh, calculation in the cheetah, at least it's uh, uh, available in the latest version. I think it's uh, version 11. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we actually use uh, that uh, similar, not that tool, that's different, similar tool to, uh, to, to calculate the, the TNT. And then we get the similar energy from what we test uh, test uh, uh, test the results. So I think that's a good. Uh, uh, this is my favorite to 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 look at the high energy material and then you especially look at the total energy uh, release. 
from that perspective. Uh, to the challenge, I think for us, it, uh, we uh, typically, the project in our company or in our process, we, uh, we, can, um, we can do a good job uh, to, under, uh, to understand the desire process. The challenge the one is the undesired, no one expected uh, present. Uh, we had a couple of cases that in a heat exchanger or some some had um, some pipe hatch, uh, possibly some material. Nobody know what it is, and then when people to open the light and then made the made the bad relations, uh, get people hurt, get the get the damage in the plan. Uh, it happens. Uh, it's just this kind of uh, the nature of this material, and uh, we, we just don't understanding everything about it. That's a mm. challenge. But it sounds it. Yeah, very much so. All right, uh, why don't we try to do one more sort of general one on risk factors. So guys, feel free to go in any of the directions that you would like. But then after that, I do see in the Q&A, we've got 13 questions in there, plus one in the chat. So I do want to, we'll have to do the transition and we'll have a brief poll as we always do. So, so risk factors, so some things might be, of course, prevention issues. And of course, you know, where should we really focus our concerns? Do, can we really, I mean, risk is all about probability, but how well does probability really come into this would I think be an interesting uh, part of this. And I, I guess I'll say, you know, anything else that you want to talk about scale issues, old bottles, change over time, those sorts of things. So that's a whole lot, give you freedom to go in whatever direction. And I think, Bart, we're up to you for starting, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, maybe indeed you, you were mentioning indeed so, something about scale. Scale is indeed very important. You might think, okay, large scale is is the worst thing. It's indeed worse if things go wrong on large manufacturing scale, they go really wrong. But the probability that they are going wrong in, in large scale manufacturing is pretty low because these are well-known processes. Uh, been there for many many years well controlled very yeah there are many control parameters uh, that are checked and, and safety is in, in place so the probability to have an issue is lower although the effect is much larger um, but on our in the r d scale even with with gram scale you can already have uh, serious issues with scattering glass etc or exploding uh, bombs or whatever uh, which could even also kill people uh, and, and cause a lot of injury. So that, that's really something that people not always uh, not always realize. And and maybe some some comments about prevention of of issues with with high energy materials. And I also mentioned in in my my one one sentence introduction. Uh, I think it's really important that you realize what chemicals, uh, that you know what chemicals you're working with, uh, that you had proper training um, at the beginning of your career and, and you have reoccurring training on, on high energy material or reactive chemicals in general. Um, also, when you introduce a change in your process or in your reaction or whatever, make sure that it's reviewed that you have a system in place or a, yeah, or a process in place to to review those changes do not just apply the changes uh, if people yeah like, like we from reactive chemicals we we do not know what people want to change so they have to trigger us or come to us with a question so we have a, uh, a process in place uh, that's the man management of of change uh, process that we have within dow to trigger people, okay, um, there's a whole set of questions, okay, and, and if you have this and this trigger, you have to contact reactive chemicals because it's it might be high energy material. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, for, again, from, from my non-SME <clears throat> uh, perspective, the whole issue of scale, especially in the lab, just brings to mind uh, uh, Texas Tech, uh, and I think it was like nickel, hydrazine, something like that, I'll probably get the material wrong. And then in, in the UK, in Bristol, I think it was, TATP, right? Uh, probably you guys know about this much more. And in that case, the researcher uh, realized that he had created quite a bit of it. I think to triacetone, triperoxide, or something like that, very energetic, and actually stopped and got his PI, and they evacuated the building, and everything uh, went OK, which was really nice. Yeah. So um, Ashok, you're next, sir. On well, I mean, uh, just to add one more is the T2 accident that happened several years ago 
um, you know, where they're making that additive for, for gasoline. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they had the kettle, they had the kettle chemistry, they knew what they were doing. But mm-hmm. as soon as they started to scale up, things, things, uh, you know, mass transport, heat transport at higher scales, totally changes from that laboratory environment. So mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that people just generally don't factor into when they're looking at their, you know, uh, bench top to kilo to pilot to then to then full scale. Um, it sort of goes by the wayside. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that people tend to forget about is when you're looking at not necessarily high energy materials, but high energy situations is when you have dust explosions, vapor gas explosions, you might start off, let's say, looking at a process in a, in a laboratory bench pilot scale, you're dealing with small quantities of materials and they're very manually driven. Um, the likelihood of, of, of an event and the severity of the event are actually very low. So the risk is very low. But as soon as you start scaling up and you start getting silos and bucket elevators and pneumatic transport involved, as opposed to just that one person carrying you know, a, a 10 pound bag and, 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 and opening it up and pouring it into a, a vat opening, you start getting into situations where um, ignition sources start accumulating. For example, electrostatic ignition sources start accumulating. And then you have other factors that, uh, that, that come in to make um, situations that you really didn't realize were going to be a problem uh, now become a problem. And now you have to protect against them by bringing in either administrative controls or engineering controls. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, great. And Min, what do you want to add? And then once Min is done, we're going to do a little transition and we're going to get right to your questions, folks. So, but go ahead, please, Min, give us, give us more here. Yep, I think uh, I, I want only uh, only one thing I want to add is uh, uh, to the probability or uh, how to prevent prevent this kind of go, this kind of uh, related instance. Uh, what we do is we actually fully in so fully investigate anything we see abnormal in the lab scale, uh, any near miss, anything unexpected, uh, uh, different uh, de- deviation from the normal batch. Uh, we actually step, step in, uh, clear, uh, classify as a near miss, and then we fully understand what's going on. And then by understanding the near miss in the lab or small scales, we can understand uh, the unexpected or undesired hazard to relate to, to those compounds. And then we can put something in the manufacturer to prevent big issue later on. Great. Thank you so much, man. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, my colleague Chris is going to launch our topic poll, and this is the opportunity, folks that are attending. Please, 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 thank you, Chris, so much. We value your uh, input here. We spend a lot of time looking at these and trying to figure out what's going to be the best sort of topic. So this is your opportunity, folks and guys. Uh, Bart, Ashok, and Min, you can take a look, but as you can see at the bottom, we can't vote. (laughs) (laughs) But you can always send your comments to me, of course. Anyone can, of course, but we really do appreciate it on the poll. And then, of course, you know, are you interested in being a panelist or do you know someone who would be? So please engage in our poll, folks. And also, though, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. It's jonathan.clain at bioraft.com really happy to get your emails, jump on a call with you or whatever, and talk something through. A lot of these, a lot of these, these webinars start by little niche conversations. And I can't remember, um, I actually think, I can't remember who it was, but someone said, oh, you really need to talk to Bart, you know? And so you need to talk to Bart about this. And Bart and I just started chatting and we decided this would be a good topic. And then we got Ashok and then we got Min. And this is how it comes together very, very organically and a lot of high energy, but not explosively. How was that for terrible puns, guys? All right. All right. Enough of my bad puns and dad jokes. All right. So in the in the QA, and so let's let's look at this from the top. So Nicholas asks, and so guys, whoever you whichever of you want to start, go ahead. And if the question is answered by one or by two, you know, we don't have to necessarily have everyone, but whatever works, guys. So Nicholas asks, how do you safely uh, store expired chemicals that may become combustible or reactive before, I'll I'll add in, ultimate disposal, right? Also, how do you safely dispose of it? So I suppose it depends on what it is, but feel free to go in whatever direction you guys would like. Who would like to start? Yeah, I think maybe I can uh, I can start. Thanks, so um, 
how can you safely store them? And it's you should not store them uh, any longer than the disposal date. So make sure that you get rid of them before the disposal date. But yeah, I know I realized that uh, yeah, you sometimes discover a lab uh, in a lab you you sometimes discover this uh, expired chemicals if they're only uh, if, yeah very short after the expiry date you might just expose and dispose it via the normal uh, chemical waste uh, um, handling facilities or, or companies but of course if it's already for a few years and for instance with peroxide formers if you start seeing crystals etc in the bottle or around the cap uh, that's maybe a good idea to evacuate your your area to uh, make sure nobody can approach that bottle and to involve the emerg emergency services to, to get rid of the, those, uh, those chemicals and, and to have specialized uh, teams to, to be involved and uh, involve uh, ESNS uh, or emergency services involve teams like our team, like reactive chemicals or any other team that you have within your company uh, to get any advice uh, on how to, uh, to approach it. And, and for any chemical, do not try to open it or do not try to uh, move it. Just leave it where it is, uh, evacuate and, and uh, barricade the area to make sure that uh, you can assess the situation in a, in a quiet way. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Ashok or Amin, yeah. it looks like Ashok, you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, please? I just want to add something where um, a lot of times, you know, your particular company may not have the resources of, of, of a larger company, in which case there are, you know, third parties available that you could, contact um, either for you know advice on what to do or else um, actual the actual chemical disposal there are there are companies that are available um, that will uh, come in and dispose chemicals up for you in that way neutralize and then and then dispose cool and min anything to add or, or not definitely definitely both uh, agree both uh, for me uh, for, for me it's uh, uh, sometimes we do see some uh, expired chemical I mean the best way you don't have the chemical expired but sometimes we do have that and then uh, maybe that's the only way you need to keep it so you cannot buy it anywhere else so we, we, what we do here is typically we recertify it such as uh, epoxide former like the diethyl ether or THF we actually measure the epoxide level if it's below the Except level, we say okay. This we can we can say it's safe to use and keep it another uh, couple months. Uh, it's okay. Uh, but however, some of the chemical is uh, you need to do some special such as the monomer. You inhibit it going going really low, and then you almost no inhibit anymore. So we need to add more inhibit. Make sure it's uh, the shelf life can extend it a little bit longer. So that was that what we do. Okay, cool. Great. And maybe one advice for, for the audience is also to make sure that you have a very good uh, chemical inventory system. So to avoid that it's uh, getting expired. And, and there are tools available indeed to, uh, to do this chemical inventory. Uh, oh. Good, good point. Thank you so much. And, and you so, can in that inventory system, you can flag mm -hmm. those chemicals that, that really have a stability issue. There's certain chemicals, for example, uh, I bought some silica, you know, uh, uh, fume silica at one time, it also had an expiry date on it. But knowing the chemistry, I don't think you're going to have that much issue with fume silica storage. But there are yeah. certain things that in there that will degrade over time. You just need to know what those chemicals are going to be. Yeah. I, and I usually don't merge sort of what we do here at BioRaft with this, but this is obviously within our wheelhouse. If you're interested, if you're interested, come back in two weeks for our product webinar on ChemTracker. We'll talk about these, these and many other issues. Thanks. So a uh, good friend of mine, Patrick Ryan, who does a lot with Has Waste, has a couple of good questions here. And if they're related enough and you can answer them together, that would probably be great, guys. But if I got that wrong, feel free to divide them up. So I'm going to read them. How stable is TATP, which I'd mentioned before, when stored underwater? And he writes, clandestine manufacturers typically store this material in mason jars in the refrigerator. That sounds incredibly hazardous. <laughs> its evaluation removal is a common issue for law enforcement personnel. I've been asked this before, have my own thoughts, and would like to learn more. And then he also asked, asks, how thermally stable is pure, entirely uncontaminated ammonium nitrate? And we've talked a lot about contamination as a strong issue here. My understanding is that it is thermally stable if uncontaminated. However, even trace amounts 
of contamination can create an unstable fuel oxidizer blend. So I'm not sure if combining those two is helpful or not, guys, but feel free to take them on. Who would like to start? Min, how's about you? I'm going to actually ask you, since you're with AgriScience, for some reason it makes sense to me. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the TATP okay. uh, that chemicals. Actually, I, I don't know what I have. It's a acronym. I don't know what the chemical is. It's sorry, sorry on that one. I think it's uh, triacetone uh, triperoxide, but keep going. Don't worry. Go go on the ammonium nitrate. I know you're familiar with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one's. I mean, every, everyone know that it's favorite. Uh, it's it's fam famous. Made a it made a, a a couple of big instance like mm. the Tianjin and the last uh, last year the Bruins uh, mm. detonations. Uh, as uh, as I say, as you actually um, you said that it's stable if it's uncontaminated. Uh, you need to either the fire to get it get it going or some other event get it, get it, get the explosion going or detonation going. Uh, for cont contamination, I think depends on what kind of contaminations. Uh, some of the contamination is it's okay, such as uh, if just the uh, hydrocarbons that typically that not too much uh, work for for the stability or the or, or, or the onset. But if you get some, uh, I'm not sure you. Uh, I I think the heavy metal tend to uh, lower the lower the stability, and then strong acid, strong base also tend to lower the uh, the stability of those uh, materials. Uh, again, uh, I I I I haven't really tested those chemical. Uh, actually, uh, we are not making that uh, chemical in 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 my company. Uh, or I or I learned from the literature. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Ashok yeah, I or think Bart, Bart, go ahead. Yeah, please, maybe. Uh, yeah, one of the ammonium nitrate incidents that happened, I think, in Toulouse, I think it was in France, was caused by contamination with mm -hmm. the chlorine component, component mm -hmm. so uh, an oxidizer. So uh, that's indeed one, also one of the typical uh, contaminations that could be an issue. Yeah. And, and I think in, in, in the States here, we had something in West Texas where we had mm -hmm. ammonium nitrate stored as fertilizer um, in you know agricultural settings where we had... Um, organic contamination from, you know, pollen and other things come in and you really don't need much, like something as little as 2% contamination by mass is more than enough to create a detonable um, ammonium nitrate, uh, you know, uh, fuel mixture. And, and any, and any answers on the TATP when stored underwater? Familiarity with that? Or that is totally out of my that? wheelhouse. I mean, it's, it's a peroxide. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, yeah, that that's totally outside of my wheelhouse. Yeah, I also don't have I don't have any experience with this component. You know, uh, I'm not that, in, uh, yeah, not I into also, the clandestine explosive yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. scene. scene. Hello. I think we have Jonathan freezing. I yeah. think so. Yeah. I know, it looks like Jonathan just lost power. Oh, no. Yeah, so um, he'll try to join us um, as soon as he can. And maybe if we just want to um, try to finish up on the on a few of these questions here. Sure. For the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> maybe Chris's so, questions next. Yeah. And I'll just let you guys kind of maybe go around and, and answer them one by one. Sure. So maybe, yeah, the question is indeed how, uh, from Chris, is how can you predict when a process is in a, is in a stable domain versus, versus when it's in an unstable domain where small changes in temperature could trigger something like thermal runaway? It's an easy question, but uh, maybe a bit more a complex answer that you um, can give on this one because... Uh, I think you need something more about the kinetics. Uh, you have to know something more about the kinetics of this reaction. So you need to do at least some, some arc testing. Uh, you also need to know something about the heat losses that you can expect and then know the balance with heat loss, heat, uh, heat gain. Then you, should, then you can calculate the temperature of no return. Um, oh, and let me... 
shoot it looks like bart is <laughs> bart is gone now too are we well, losing I, people one by one i know it's like uh it's like an agatha christie uh novel <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, but I, I just to just to follow up on what bart was saying i think you know a lot of this is experimentally determined whether you know adiabatic calorimetry or accelerated rate calorimetry developing kinetic information uh you know activation energy pre-exponential factor to then model um what those domains can be i think i think really a lot of this is um really going to the lab and studying the, the kinetics and the reactions that are potentially uh possible with with your material in its stable form as well as once that stabilizer like a um you know uh, a uh, an inhibitor has been used up and then at that point uh, what is the reactivity of the material with the inhibitor in place and then without the inhibitor? Yeah, I would. I just want to add on it uh, uh, for us also uh, learn from now is we use a lot of uh, term called TNR, temperature of no returns. Uh, that's actually a, a, a safety limit uh, for the production or manufacturers. Uh, if your temperature below the TNR, the temperature low returns, uh, typically if you just uh, have a couple of temperature uh, oscillation or violations, you are okay because your cooling capability of your reactor or your process still uh, above your uh, heat generation uh, capability. Uh, so you actually can bring the process back to stable, but if your uh, temperature change even couple of degrees C and uh, the last the last uh, the highest one actually get above the TNR then you are in the unstable domain because you are uh, in the no return uh, domain that's unstable uh, back uh, that's what, what we used a lot in the in the in the in the, in the, in the productions uh, this actually related to what Bob mentioned we need to allow the uh, the kinetics the heat generations of your desired reaction or the, of the decomposition reaction and then also you need to know the process the cooling capability uh, of your process and then you come with a uh, 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 with will come out as the TNR temperature and then we go with that and use that a lot in the productions. Hey, uh, I'm back, but I, I can't access the Q&A. So you guys are going to have to help me out here. But sure. it sounds like it's going really well. I lost power here. Sorry. I think then I think Chris's question has been answered. Um, yeah. We can go I, on to maybe Marcus's question. Yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you. What does that one say? Sure. At lab scale quantities for the testing of ethers, uh, what would you use as an action threshold for organic peroxide? In other words, at what concentration of organic peroxide would you not use uh, a solvent in an evaporation reaction? So, yeah, what, uh, what do you guys think? And then Jack added, to tag along with that, could you explain why that's your threshold? Um, I've seen many numbers, very few explanation of rationale. Yeah, I think those numbers that are that you can find in literature are based on experimental, yeah, or issues that or uh, yeah, explosions that happened or incidents that happened. Typically, we use something like 250 milligrams per kilogram to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, if it's in that range, then you yeah, you should not distill it anymore or not concentrate it anymore. But yeah, what, what is the reason for for this 250? Yeah, that, that just we think that this is a safe concentration based on experience. Uh, yeah. Okay. And for a lot of those things, there's probably been an internal memo that's in the files of your company from back in the 50s that that people have just been you know using as a, as a bench scale reference without you know current modern or or this generation of engineers or chemists not not really understanding where it came from. And we see that a lot in, in various um, ASTM committees when we're, we're making up standards, you know, where did the actual rationale come from or when we're in, a, in, in, in other you know, occupancy standard uh, committees like NFPA, where do these certain guidelines come from? And a lot of it's from practical experience that have happened decades ago that are now just tribal knowledge almost. Mm. Interesting. Good. Um, Chris, do you want to read the next question? Unfortunately, yeah. I can't get the Q&A on my phone. 
Yeah, no worries. Um, so the next question was by Jack as well. And it says, uh, does what you think of as a high energy material change based on scale? For example, looking at one liter of eth ethanol ether versus a thousand liters. Yeah, as as such, uh, for instance, this example, uh, ethyl ether is an uh, ethyl ether is an peroxide former. As such, the pure component is not a high energy material. It's only when it's forming peroxide that it's a high energy material. But for the real high energy materials, even gram scale can be already. Yeah, there's not really any limit. Starting from one kilogram is dangerous, uh, or and below not. It's already at, at gram scale that it can be uh, hazardous uh, for for equipment and and your and, and yourself. Right. I think you go back to you know risk, right? So probability of occurrence yeah. um, by uh, severity of consequence. So whatever that one liter, whatever the consequence of that one liter reacting versus one thousand liters, if if the consequence is acceptable, that's where you'd say, well, that's where I would no longer consider it, you know, a risky high energy material, but like, like what Bart said is that a lot of these things, even if you have, you know, two or three grams of TNT, uh, depending on your environment, that might be dangerous enough for you to consider it a high energy material. Um, but if you happen to be out in the middle of the field in the middle of nowhere, maybe you need to bring that up to, you know, hundred grams or 200 grams of TNT in order to make a, a, a difference. Yep, totally agree. Uh, I actually uh, uh, lead an investigation, which is uh, an instance caused by, I think, milligram scale of high energy materials. Wow. Uh, what happened is the guy actually tried to uh, push a pipe uh, into a feeding, and then the feeding was from a used pump. Uh, there are maybe thin layer of uh, copper azide was on the feeding, and then when he pushed it, and then made a degradation in his hand. So that made it OSHA. Wow. Wow. So, even a couple of milligrams can make a instance. Amazing. That's a that's a great that's a great story to to have everyone understand how really serious and risky it can be even at that mi at that micro scale. Thanks, man. Great guys. Chris, what's the next uh, question in the queue, please? Yeah. So the next one. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The next one. We go, Marcus, Jack, um, and. Uh, Purely if we have time just for fun and who doesn't like some fun, what is the least stable compound you've ever had to handle or evaluate? Wow, that's, that's hard. Um, some of the things that, like, I'd say more along the lines of surprises. Um, we, you know, sometimes when we've dealt with some nanomaterials like nanometals, uh, we wouldn't expect them to be pyrophoric, but they turn out to be pyrophoric uh, when we're doing dust, combustible dust testing on them. As soon as you open up the, the jar to pour it into uh, the vessel to, to watch the reaction, it sort of surprised us that, you know, nano copper was, was energetically pyrophoric. Um, so some of that's have happened to us in, in the lab scenario. What about yeah. for Bart? Yeah, yes. The, what, what about yeah, the you? example I'm thinking of and, and that we experienced ourselves in our lab here in Tunusian is uh, an example just where we mixed ethylene oxide with, with sulfuric acid uh, and even at very small scale in our arc equipment it was really immediately going sky high I never saw such a huge exotherm in my life so we did not expect it uh, to be so exothermic uh, so uh, yeah it's not really the fancy chemicals but uh, just uh, very energetic materials hmm. that's an interesting one min uh, what about what about you at corteva yeah, we actually, uh, since we are actually the team to handle those material and then categorize those material, give you some number, we actually have explosion in the lab, in the equipment, almost uh, at least uh, two or three times a year. So even the DLC, we have a big explosion inside of the DLC and then damage the DLC, that happens. We only load a one milligram uh, sample into the DLC and then made the declarations and then damage the instrument. But the good thought is uh, it's better to make a declaration over here instead of in the large scales. Always better in a controlled environment, right, guys? Cool. Chris, do we have more questions, sir? We certainly do. Um, <laughs> and 
thank you everyone for sticking around with us for a few more minutes. Mm. We'll try to wrap up in the next uh, eight, eight to nine minutes. Um, but I thought, uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead because I thought this was a good one. It's again, it's from Jack. Um, what's your threshold for when you call the bomb squad versus try to deactivate mm. something? I thought this was a good one to follow up on. It is. Yeah, I think also that there's not really any real limit that you can say, okay, from that concentration, it really depends on the history of the bottle that you found. Uh, if you really see crystals, that, that's really a trigger, okay, that there are uh, paroxides that are crystal crystallized, so, so that's really a, a risk that you should involve uh, external companies or, or other people. Um, yeah, if if it, I just was recently called just before the the holiday period. Um, they, they found some uh, some organic compound, in peroxide form, and they measured 1,000 ppm of of peroxide in it. So, just based on the history of that that component, there we could just uh, yeah get rid of it with with the normal waste company and the normal waste round that is coming every month. So we just uh, also uh, announced it to the company okay you can pick up this this peroxide uh, component so there's not really a real limit just use common sense and and yeah look to it case to case and then assess the hazard so what could go, go wrong uh, no. a shock or man yeah i i, I think it would be knowledge i mean how comfortable mm. are you mm. in your ability to to, to deactivate that you know uh one gallon carboy that you have of uh of material if you if you don't feel comfortable or if you have even the shadowest you know slightest shadow of doubt call the bomb squad if you're if you're 110 percent sure that you know how to do it and you've done it before and you're and you feel comfortable and trained then i think that you know you probably can can take the attempt of, of decontaminating it or deactivating it I think that's I think that's a good approach. Min, what else would you like to add to this? No, nothing to add. I think that both made a great point. Okay, cool. That was a good that was a good question, Chris. Any any other uh, ones that, that you're looking at? Or guys, yeah. feel free to suggest. Yeah, yeah, feel free. But uh, the other one I was just thinking of is um, if you're presented with a novel compound that you believe may be unstable. Um, uh, and you're not uh, confident handling it to test it, and you're not able to model it, where do you look to get more information to inform your assessment? Yep, uh, I go with that one. Uh, I think that it's already uh, mentioned in the in, in the chat, the breath labs is a great uh, reference to go with, or start with. And then just sometimes you even, go, even Google it uh, with the function group, and then maybe add one carbon onto it, and then looking for a symbol uh, compound instead of uh, maybe giant uh, or uh, structures, and then whether you can find any information or instant related to those function groups, uh, also a good starting point uh, for that. Yeah, and, and, and if you're not feeling comfortable, uh, yeah, then based on literature, you can start testing. But even if you're not feeling comfortable to test it in, on the pure material, you can also dilute or test it on the diluted uh, material first. And also on small scale. So in the DSC, take uh, yeah less than one milligram uh, in, in your DSC, then, then uh, that will uh, yeah reduce the risks that you uh, that you would encounter during sample handling, sample loading, and testing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Anything to add, sir? No, you know, just, you know, I totally agree with both both uh, mm. uh, Bart and, and Min that, you know, start off small, dilute if necessary, and really hit the library, you know, hit, hit the books, find out if you can get as much data as you can um, before you, you, you approach the chemical. Makes, yeah, makes no. sense to me. Yeah, and also check with the, if you're purchasing chemicals, also check with the vendor. That's also a great resource. Check SDS sheets. That's also a great resource. Um, also internal literature. You, you can check if you have it available, historical incidents. You, all these kind of things are all great resources that you can check before actual, uh, actual testing. Although yeah. I, I would tend to shy away from, or I would not put as much trust in the safety data sheets. Um, yeah, so, but sometimes that's the only thing that you yeah, have. Exactly. Those so, are more legal documents yeah. than they are actual they safety are documents. 
Yeah, they're, they're too often written by the attorneys, aren't they? <laughs> you know, it, it occurred to me to add to this, but also to the previous question, which I thought was really good. This is where humility is much more important than hubris, right? Absolutely. It's to admit, you know, I don't know and I need help. You know, I think what separated say like the Texas Tech versus the Bristol one is that in, in Bristol, the researcher knew that it, it was a huge problem and felt very comfortable calling his PI and his PI immediately reacted in the best way. Thank you so much. Stop everything. Let's get everyone out. Let's get some help. And, and so, and I think that that's really an important consideration here. It's really comes down to a lot of of safety culture type issues, just to just to um, add that to the mix. Absolutely, Chris. Do we have time for one more? Or yeah, not, I was thinking, I think we should do one more because it, it looks like a, a bunch of people kind of gave the thumbs up on this one. So, okay, from Nikki Nikki Young. It says, "Are there any specific trainings you would suggest for laboratory mm -hmm. staff who deal with high energy materials?" Wow. <laughs> yeah, and to be and honest, we're I, happy. Yes. Besides, besides getting a PhD or a PE, right? <laughs> and maybe we can post some of these, Jonathan, or or if you guys yeah. want to send us some of your ideas after the call, that might be great too. We can post them up on this on this blog. Yeah, you know, quite frankly, this is almost like one of those things where laboratory safety, like this, is is almost where it's an apprenticeship. You're you're dealing with a senior chemist or a senior chemical engineer or a senior scientist that sort of, you know, points these out to you other than let's say going to a, you know, Brethrix is a thing to, to first go to, or then Cheetah is a tool that you can use. Um, other than doing that yourself, a lot of this is, are things where, 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 where young, young career professionals learn from senior career professionals, what, what could, what could happen and what, what they should look into. So it's very much almost like an apprenticeship program mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a classical learning environment mm -hmm. yeah also in, in DAO we have a similar approach so it's more an internal training that we have so I, i'm also not aware of any specific external trainings that are available on the on the market uh, so we do everything in, on hand on hand uh, training by colleagues and and uh, have internal trainings yeah. min do you have anything to add to it and then i think chris and i are going to wrap it up guys no, I, I don't have any external training. Maybe I yeah. could someday. Maybe I could someday I train other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think that the I, apprenticeship. I would, sign up. Or, I would sign up. Yeah, the <laughs> apprenticeship approach is a good one, and I will just say real quickly, as a former um, training provider, I'm not at all surprised that there isn't training on this. It would be such a high liability and cost, oh, okay, good and. Point. I think it would be very difficult to get insurance as a, as a trainer in that. Well, great. Well, guys, thank you so, so much. We got so many great, great comments. People love the conversation. They love getting all the details, the resources. Definitely, oh, someone put the FBI office <laughs> sometimes. Um, definitely send any more uh, resources or thoughts on any of this sort of stuff. And we'll, we'll try to do a compilation. We'll download the chat. We'll download the Q&A and all of that. And I'll just say uh, on behalf of everyone here on the whole team at BioRaft, thank you guys for, for being such wonderful panelists. And thank you everyone who's still remaining and logging off. Thank you for coming and joining us today. We appreciate it greatly. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you Thanks, all. everyone. Thanks, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. Take care. Take care. Bye.